The biggest telephone company in Canada is named Bell. The largest in the U.S. is called AT&T. But it used to be 52 separate companies, all named Bell. The man who their name is based off of? Alexander Graham Bell. Bell is most famous for inventing the telephone, but the Scottish man has very deep Canadian roots. He is named after his father, but his middle name Graham was chosen for a Canadian doctor who saved his father's life. Fast forward and he has graduated from the University of London and is moving to Canada. Bell was coming with his brother's widow's mother and his father. Both of his older brothers died and the family agreed to take care of both of their widows. In 1870, they acquired a 10 acre property in Tutela Heights, Ontario. This is now a national historic site called the Melville House. Bell set up a makeshift lab and began doing his work. While he found London was quite stuffy, he found Canada's climate more to his liking. He often looked across the river to the Six Nation Reserve, one of the many groups of Mohawk Nation. Before the 19th century, there was no written language for Aboriginal peoples in Canada. It meant that they would be forced to write in English and French to do their business. This was a real problem for them because it meant that their language was changing and being replaced every day. Even by the 19th century, there is no reason to believe that what the Mohawks say was actually their original language. Even today, linguists compose and recreate dead languages playing guessing games as to what they were. So when I say that Bell saved the Mohawk language, understand that he kept the language from extinction. Bell's father Melville studied phonetics, and some of this rubbed off on their son, who had a lifelong obsession with communication. The young Alexander Bell went to greet the Mohawks at the reserve, who were hostile to outsiders, and he learned their language. After learning their language, he worked with the Mohawks to get it down on paper and learn how to write. Bell figured out that the Mohawk language used compound words, like in German, and created intonations to emphasize sounds. For example, the word one book is pronounced skahia ton hisera and spelled as one word. The word two books is tekahion ton hisera and also spelled as a single word. Young Bell had also invented a new type of pump organ that could project sound a lot further than older ones. It never saw commercial use but he could use it to entertain the Mohawks across the river. His father Melville had taken up a position at the University of Montreal, and Alexander went with him. Young Alexander Bell worked with the teachers of the deaf on how to use his father's method and how to get deaf people speaking. Among his most famous pupils was Helen Keller, who was blind, deaf, and mute. Bell believed that technology could make the disabled functional members of society. Six months later, we move to the year 1871. A young Bell is beginning work on his telephone. He realizes that if he sends sounds down a line at different pitches, it is almost audible. More work is necessary, but this pet project was not something he could do without money. Bell gets a job working in Boston at a lab, but takes his work back with him in Canada. He makes Boston the center of all signals, and his family home in Canada, the receiver. One such device was the phonograph, the first device ever to record sound. The device could record sound waves on paper. It was with this invention they first hypothesized the telephone. With the telegraph boom hitting America, Bell was successful in convincing investors Gardner Hubbard and Thomas Sanders to sponsor his invention of the telephone. This forever locked him into America until the job was done. Fast forward 10 years and the Bell Telephone Company is invented and hundreds of thousands of people are making and receiving phone calls in the United States. The company has long since been split up and its descendants own shares in various telephone companies. A much older Bell sets up a summer home in a small Nova Scotia town named Bedeck. Today, the Bell Summer Home is a protected national site. Bell had to run the business in Boston, but his heart was for peace and solitude of rural Nova Scotia. Bell would use his Bedeck home for a very large number of experiments and recruited a very large number of mechanics, engineers, and scientists to help him build his machines. One of these first inventions included a basic air conditioning system in which ice would be placed in a vent 
and blown with an electric fan. It worked. He never made a sale of this invention, but does own a patent on it. There were dozens of people at the time looking to invent an air conditioning system for factories and transport. Bell would not live long enough to see the invention of refrigeration. Bell's most famous invention in Nova Scotia was sustained flight. Many will look at the Wright brothers as the fathers of flight. The Wright brothers deserve a lot of credit for simply showing it could be done. However, what the Wright brothers did was create a machine that could go into the air, lose control, and with enough practice crash in a manner that would leave the pilot living and the machine partially intact. By no means was this sustainable or anything that anyone would want to do. The thought of flying around in an airplane had no future. It had so little future that people began investing their money in the Zeppelin industry. So when Bell looked at what the Wright brothers did, he is correct in thinking it was entirely foolish. Bell wanted to build a machine that could sustain flight and safely land. He wanted to build something that could be reusable and cost effective. You can see a modern version of this going on right now with SpaceX and Boeing. They are trying to build reusable and safe rockets for going into outer space, whereas the old way of going into space was expensive and not sustainable without government funding. Bell attracted to his cause John McCurdy, mechanical engineer, and Glenn Curtis, a motorcycles manufacturer. Together, they formed the Aerial Experiment Association, or the AEA. Bell named his creation the Silver Dart. The machine was composed of bamboo, inflated balloons, hockey tape, and steel tubing. The engine used in the machine was from a motorcycle that Curtis supplied. Another associate, Casey Baldwin, agreed to be the pilot and in 1909, the plane took off from a frozen Ross Dover Lake and sustained flight in 1909. McCurdy would set records for the rest of his life. In 1909, he was the first pilot in the British Empire and the first British citizen to achieve flight. And in 1911, he chartered his first passenger flight from Florida to Cuba. Curtis would go on to create an airplane manufacturing company. Thankfully for Curtis, World War I broke out, and there was an almost an infinite demand for spy planes from Curtis Aircraft. Almost a decade later, he would work with McCurdy again by merging McCurdy's new Reed Aircraft Company with Curtis. And Casey would continue working with Bell. Bell wasn't done inventing. Bell's next project was a hydrofoil. Bell wanted to invent a method in which the boat would leave the water as it gained speed. This is not something that Bell had thought up himself, but something he had read in a British journal. He, however, wanted to put the hypothesis to the test. Bell created the Bell HD4. Engineer Casey Baldwin had helped with the construction of the Silver Dart and was now looking to make hydrofoils a thing. The first HD4 had a Renault engine in it and could achieve a maximum speed of 80 km per hour. They wanted to go faster. Only one problem. There was a war going on, and this thing wasn't for war. Manufacturers and nations were unwilling to part with much to help Bell invent a faster-moving watercraft. However, when the war ended, he was able to buy all the parts he needed. In 1919, Bell and Baldwin were able to break the world sea speed record at 114 km per hour. This record was eventually beaten by a jet-powered watercraft in Australia. Despite evidence of its speed, the HD4 sold very few units, and was discontinued. Bell's final invention attempt was one he would never see built. Looking at the airplane and the hydrofoil, he realized he could combine them into one apparatus. Unlike previous inventions, this one had wide commercial and military application. In a world without airports and airstrips, a plane that could land and take off almost instantly from lakes and oceans could tip the balance of power in the world. People were inventing seaplanes, but seaplanes required a fairly large lake to fly out of. But Bell would die only months after beginning this new project. His protege, Casey Baldwin, would receive endless grant money from Bell's company to continue the work. But, try as he might, a flying hydrofoil could never be accomplished. Bell was survived by two daughters, who had lived to see Bell's telephone monopoly split up. As for Bell, it is now a Canadian tradition to drop an F-bomb, followed by the man's name. <laughs>